Right, can we take a look at UFC 282 coming our way this weekend? Obviously, new main event headlined now by Jan Blakovich taking on Magomed and Kalayev in the uh, for the vacant light heavyweight title. Uh, effectively, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through a few fights on this card. There are a lot of good fights on this card. I'm going to pick out a few of them that have piqued my interest, do a bit of background on both the fighters, what they do well, what they don't possible openings. Uh, the research is all there, but then I like to uh, ruin that by making some of the most terrible picks on earth. They're fans, they're hilarious in fact, because I just like to keep the odds long and the stakes low and the bets terrible. So let's start off in the heavyweight division. There's a real nice heavyweight fight taking place. This could, this could headline a fight night fairly easily. Jarzino Rosenstroik versus Chris Dalkus. Now, Let's take a look at the tail of the tape first of all. Are there any glaring kind of differences in the height and in the reach? You've got Rosenstroik is uh, 6'2", 7'8". So Rosenstroik's got a slight reach advantage, very slight. Uh, there's really not much in it. Uh, they're both kind of the same kind of stature, like physically. But what I would say is that Rosenstroik, he comes in with a heavy kickboxing style, and Dalkus, he's got an excellent boxing, and he's also Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. So uh, Dalkus is, is probably a little bit faster. I would say that Ro Rosenstroik has probably got a slight edge in the power department. So for me, the problem Dalkus has got here is that he's, he's fighting a guy who's almost, not the opposite, but like the, the opposite in terms of striking. Rosenstroik is very slow, very deliberate. He picks his shots, and he—if you allow him to get into a fight, he will—he will—he will really piece you up. He's very patient as well. If you watch how patient he was against Alistair Overeem, I mean, that just goes to show. Literally one shot can end it. I thought personally the Overeem fight was called off slightly early because, but it did split you know Overeem's face basically in half, like his lip was like in two pieces. So the referee jumped in, completely understandable. But that was right at the end of the very last round. And it wasn't like Overeem was knocked out, but it just serves as a reminder that there's always danger when it comes to Jarzino Rosenstrike. I'm a big fan of his, honestly. He's, there, there's a lot of jeopardy in this fight because actually Dorcas, he's kind of the other way when it comes to striking. He's very, very fast and that speed makes up for some of the lacking, uh, not lacking technique for, for lack of a better word, because it's not that he hasn't got technique. It's just that he does certain things uh, that we've seen has resulted in him, in him getting countered. Uh, when he rushes in, he tends to leave his head on the set, on the center line. His head doesn't really move off the center line really that much. So they know that where when he throws his punch, they know where his head is going to be. And that got exposed by Derek Lewis, who just has a great fight instinct, honestly. Great, he just knows how to put a fist on that chin. And uh, obviously, we saw that against uh, Curtis Blades, who, with respect, Curtis Blades is not a natural striker. He is a wrestler with a big right hand, and he and he was able to catch Dorcas. So Dorcas, defensively, I feel like hopefully he's addressed some of those issues because if he hasn't, he could be in real trouble here because Jarzino Rosenstruck, he 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 was look he again he they're both coming off two losses here. Neither of them are in a brilliant position. This could be the last time you see either of these two in the UFC. There's that added pressure. But Blades and Volkov, you know, they're, they're both perfectly reasonable losses. Uh, Volkov really, it, it, that, that was a kickboxing match and just, you know, it's very difficult to win a kickboxing match against a seven foot tall Russian kind of powerhouse. So Dorcas, uh, his losses were Lewis to, to Lewis and Blades. Uh, both big knockout losses. Uh, I believe Jarzino and Street lost by decision to Curtis Blades. Now, for me, the real key, if Dorcas wants to win this fight, and he has actually come out and said he wants to make this an, an MMA fight, which is good. That's very good. Because I don't feel like he he gets the better of a kickboxing match with Jarzino Rosenstroik. I feel like that would be the path of most resistance. And really what he wants is the path of least resistance. Because Dor uh, Dorcas is a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belt. And... He's, but we just haven't really seen that much of it. He usually prefers to stand and strike. I feel like the best path to victory is for Dorcas to take this to the ground or at least threaten the takedown. The only problem here is that uh, Rosenstroik has got a takedown defense of 75%. So three quarters of the time he does 
in fact, defend the takedown. But that doesn't mean that Dorcas shouldn't try it because you start giving him those looks, it disrupts the striking rhythm of Jarzino. So, yeah. So for me, I don't know. I think that Dorcas should try and take this to the ground. Do I think it's necessarily going to get there? I'm not sure. Is it going to get there in time? I don't know either. So I can, this one, it, look, it can easily go either way. I kind of like Jarzino Dosenstroik. So I'm going to pick <laughs> for, uh, not that I dislike him. I'm going to pick for Dorcas here. I don't, it really, this one is a coin toss. I'm going to pick Dorcas just because he's got the speed to rush in there and land. And he has got good power. And we saw against uh, Nganu, Jarzino Rosenstroik kind of got exposed in that regard. He wasn't ready for that rushing attack. I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Dorcas go rushing in. And yes, he does leave his head exposed, but he also hits with some savage ferocity. Speed and velocity are killers, especially at heavyweight. There's very little margin for error in the heavyweight division. So I'm going to go with Dorcas by knockout. I, I, th I think that might happen. Uh, I don't, I'd, yeah, really interesting fight. Really interesting fight. I'll roll the dice and Dorcas by knockout, but I'll be perfectly happy to see Jarzino Dosenstroik get his hand raised. Um, yeah, best of luck to both guys. I'm really looking forward to this fight. So, this next fight, you've got Bryce Mitchell against Ilya Topuria. Uh, this is quite, yeah, this is going to be an interesting fight in the featherweight division. This one is going over onto my Patreon. So, if you would like to see this breakdown, please head over to the Burt Locker on Patreon now. Thank you. And we move on to Darren Till versus Dudaikis Duplacis. This is a really interesting fight. I mean, because obviously it's, it's the return of Darren Till. Uh, we haven't seen him in some time. He's been battling quite a lot of injuries. Obviously, we saw him get beaten by uh, Derek Brunson in that tough fight. That was a tough matchup for him. This one, I feel like it's a slightly more favourable matchup for Till, but not completely. Dreykus Duplacis is very, very dangerous. Uh, make no mistake about that. So you've got Darren Till coming in at 18, 4 and 1. You've got Dreykus Duplacis coming in at 17 and 2. Uh, UK versus South Africa. Uh, Till's slightly shorter, like one inch shorter. The reach in favour of Duplacis as well. So yeah, that, that could be an issue because the thing is, right, Darren Till's very good when he's dictating the range. When he dictates the range, he's really, really fantastic because he kind of picks his shots. He's very accurate and he and he he just he just puts his combinations together very, very well. But he's not necessarily the Yeah, this is actually a tougher matchup than I thought. I mean the thing is, like these are gonna be skewed by the uh, Tavares fight because there was a lot landed in there, but look at how busy uh, like as to places is 6.55 strikes a minute versus Darren Till's 2.26 and the accuracy is not that much different honestly so the, the problem is like as he does he does absorb more strikes so what that that doesn't really yeah that doesn't really separate them that much and in the grappling like as does tend to shoot slightly more like as has 100% takedown defense although I would say that I'm not I wouldn't. I wouldn't think that Darren Till is going to be shooting double legs on Dyker to places. I just. I just don't feel like that is going to be on the cards. So, speaking generally, both of these guys are very, very good. Till is probably slightly better at keeping the distance, picking the high percentage shots, and using his footwork. And all jokes aside, all jokes aside, with the uh, the, the Jorge Masvidal knockout and him getting clipped by Woodley. All that aside. Darren Till's defense is actually pretty good. Like you saw against Robert Whittaker. Like if you can stand toe to toe with Robert Whittaker for that amount of time, I'm sorry, but your your defense in striking must be very very good. He's very high level. He's been training very hard for this fight. I've seen all of like the kind. Of, I'm sure you know Duplacis has is as well. Like it's it's, it's a no brainer that every fighter is training hard for these fights. But Duplacy's defense is not as good as Darren Till's, not from what I've seen, right? Especially when you saw in, in, in that Brad Tavares fight, that was a war, right? It was a war that uh, that went back and forth, and Duplacy's ate a lot of shots because his defense didn't allow him to slip, move out of the way. He just threw back with a vengeance. 
And that's the problem here, isn't it? Because Duplace is as tough as old boots. And we saw him in that battle with Tavares. That one fight, it's told, it showed us so much about Dreykus Duplace's. Number one, his defense can be exposed. But number two, even if you expose his defense, you're going to have to have some power to be able to put him away. Because that guy will bite down on the mouthpiece and he will just throw back at you. Does Darren Till have the power at middleweight to stop Dreykus Duplace's? I'm not sure that he does. I just, mm, I feel like he had great power at welterweight, at middleweight. We just haven't seen that power transfer. And the problem we've got here is Dreykus Duplacis. He, he has a lot of power. And because he's got a few, he's got a few knockouts on his record. But it's just, you saw him, you know, you just saw the power like, because he, he, he knocked out uh, Tevin Giles, Marcus Perez in his first two fights. And again, you know, Brad Tavares is tough in his own right. But f yeah, for me, Darren Till, he, he, he's very good at, at picking strikes and, and outpointing people. But Duplacis is very good at making these fights nasty, ugly and nasty. So basically to ball down till's gonna have to be perfect for three rounds here and you know what he could be perfect for three rounds here because Taron till is more than capable of being perfect for three rounds he really is he's very high level do places what he lacks in footwork and defense he more than makes up for with raw horsepower and just his aggressive style so Whilst I think that Till can be perfect for three rounds, I just feel like that jeopardy of Duplacis is always there. Duplacis is just not under any pressure. The other thing you've got to take into account is there's a lot of pressure on Darren Till now. How many losses has he had in a row? I'm going to have a look because obviously Dreykus is coming off a win, off that win over, um, over Brad Tavares. But not only have we not seen Darren Till in quite a while, but he's, he's coming off two losses to Robert Whisker and Derek Brunson. They got that win over Gaslam, but before then, there's losses to Tyron Woodley and Hawaii Masvidal. That's losses in four out of his last five fights. If he loses this one, that's three in a row. I'm not sure. Like, I don't know. I don't want to wish... I'm, I'm, obviously, I hope that doesn't happen. I hope he doesn't have to kind of cross that bridge. But he might. Because after that, he's, he's kind of like... Mm. I've seen the UFC cut people for less. That must be playing into the mind of Darren Till because a lot of fighting is a mental game as well. You've got to remember that. And so, yeah, for me, Duplacis is under no pressure. He's going to go out there. He's just going to be physical and aggressive. He's probably going to be having some fun. He's probably going to make this fight ugly. I am going to take Dreykus Duplacis to get the finish. I think he gets the TKO or the knockout. I hope I'm wrong. I really, really do hope I'm wrong. Uh, I'm not saying that Darren Till can't be perfect for three rounds. I'm sure that he can. But uh, I don't know. Dreykus de Places, he's pretty special in his own right. So for me, because I will be pulling for Darren Till, not by much because I'm a big fan of Du Places as well, uh, I will be putting my money on Dreykus Du Places to get the finish by knockout or TKO. And yeah, but I'm interested. It's an interesting fight. Very interesting fight. Paddy Pimlet versus Jared Gordon is another interesting fight taking place in the 155 pound weight class. So you've got uh, Pimlet. He's got quite a height and reach advantage. Well, he's, he's got one inch of height, but he's got like a five inch reach advantage over, over Jared Gordon. I think that's going to be significant here, actually. So you've got Paddy Pimlet coming in at 19 and three. Gordon coming in at, um, uh, yeah, Gordon coming in at 19 and five. So... Both of these guys, uh, you know, they, they do it like you've got Paddy Pim that he's a black belt under Paul Rimmer, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. We know how good Paddy's grappling is. Generally speaking, he's he's very good at rushing. He he knows what he's going for before he goes for it and he'll, he'll create some chaos. He'll get the body lock do a beautiful judo throw and then he's already getting in the position it's that positional awareness that allows him to get the amount of submissions that he does and it's really really good it's great to watch really really good gordon brown, uh, gordon uh, is a brown belt under under john danaher we all know who john danaher is right so you know a brown belt under john danaher that is no that's nothing to be sniffed at Johnny, he's obviously a very high level practitioner himself but my question would be is he as high level as Paddy Pimlet? 
<clears throat> maybe not. He, he really might not be here. Now, that's not to underestimate him. Obviously, MMA Jiu-Jitsu can be very different because obviously a lot of it goes out the window when you've been hit a few times. Um, Paddy Satcher should probably help him on the feet though because he's quite, he's quite tall, he fights long very well. And the thing that I like about Paddy and his striking is, yeah, right, it, it looks like He's got like, you know, bad defense, everything like that. He's leaving his chin exposed. And um, yeah, he does. And he's got a great chin. And that's why he can do that. But he also, once he knows he's got a, his opponent slightly hurt, he kind of starts flowing. And it's very difficult to predict where the next strike is coming from. Because I'm not sure he even really knows. But he, 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 he's, he knows his striking style so well that he doesn't have to know where his next strike is going. It's, it's very difficult to block an attack where, and try and predict where your opponent is going to go when they don't know where they're going to go. And that's when he creates those like chaotic moments where he'll grab the body lock and he'll grab, he'll do those judo throws and they really are fantastic. I could see that happening in this one. Honestly, I give Paddy Pimlet a slight edge in every area in this fight. He, he, I think that he's on the feet. He's slightly more dangerous. Yes, there is a chance that he leaves his chin out there. And yes, there is a chance that Jared Gordon clips it. I'm not saying that that's not a possibility. It's a distinct possibility. It always is. When you've got Paddy Pimlet in there, obviously he does leave his chin exposed. That is a thing. But also he does throw out these wonderful flying knees. He's quite long. He, and he uses that range well. He, he, he uses like the teep kicks and he uses the leg kicks to measure that distance. And when he's comfortable in that distance, that's when Paddy will throw those punches. And that's when he'll sting you. And that's when he gets you to the ground. And I think when he gets him on the ground, I think actually we're going to find out there's levels to, to, the, to you know, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as we all know. And I think I, I could see Paddy getting the submission here. I really can. I mean, maybe I'm blinded by like the hype or whatever. I'm not saying that, it, that Jar Jared Gordon is the best fighter that Paddy Pim that has fought so far, I would say. I'd say that, you know, with the greatest of respect to his previous opposition. But I still don't know if Jared Gordon is going to be good enough to stop the relentless kind of throws and ground attacks that Paddy Pimlet brings to the octagon. I'm going to take Paddy Pimlet. by submission. And then we move on to the main event of the evening. You've got Jan Blakovic, versus Magomed Ankalaev. So, tail of the tape on this one, obviously. Uh, we saw uh, Jiri Prochaska, he's, he's uh, got a shoulder problem, so he's relinquished the title, and they're doing this one instead. Uh, Jan Blakovic coming in at 29-9, and uh, Ankalaev coming in at 18-1, and one. that one obviously being that uh, submission loss to Paul Craig, where he got submitted with like one second left in the round. That's quite significant, actually, when you look at how long was left, because he could have held on, I think. Like, I don't know why he tapped when he did, but Anyway, Taylor Tape here, you've got Jan Blakovic is slightly shorter, but he's actually got the reach advantage. He's got about three inches in reach. And that is that is key here because the problem the, the, the problems that Jan Blakovic presents are his his range. Basically, when you're looking at this fight, right, it's easy to say, conventional wisdom, it's easy to say that Ankalaev is gonna blast through uh, Jan Blakovic, just because Jan Blakovic is quite old at this point. I, I say quite old. He's, uh, what is he, 39? I don't know. I don't know how old he is. He's, yeah, he's, he's, a, he's, a pro he, he's approaching that age anyway. And Ankalaev, obviously, he's very dangerous. He's, he's being called the dark horse of the division. But to be honest, like I said, there's... I thought he struggled against Thiago Santos, and I think that Jan Blakovic, with respect, beats Thiago Santos most times. I think that I think I think Jan Blakovic probably puts Thiago Santos away, uh, even though I'm, I'm fairly sure that um, this is uh, this is light heavyweight Jan. But yeah, because because uh, I'm fairly sure that Jan Blakovic does in fact have a loss to um, Thiago Santos, so I might be c completely talking out of my ass here. Uh, yeah, he does. Yeah, <laughs> he got knocked out. That was at middleweight though. That was at middleweight. I think. Anyway, but for me, I don't know. The 2021 Jan Blakovic versus Thiago Santos, I feel like that goes very, very differently. I really do. I feel like Jan Blakovic really came into his own, kind of started working out what he does well. And 
but to be fair, like I said, Ankalaev, he's really, really dangerous, but there are certain aspects to his game that have been exposed. He can sometimes get drawn into the chaos. Ian Kutalaba, like, drew him into the chaos, even if it was very, very briefly, and obviously it still didn't go Eon's way. And, you know, Paul Craig, he got him in that submission, and he tapped very, very quickly. I don't know, because it... But he had no time left on the clock. He could have toughed that out. I'm sure his coaches were probably pissed after that, honestly. But, yeah... For me, yes, okay. He's just very dangerous, you know, especially on the feet. He's got great ground and pound. I don't really know how good his wrestling is because he doesn't tend to wrestle that much. But then you've got Jan Blakovic on the other side who has the championship experience. He's been five rounds quite a lot in his career. And Ankalaev, I believe this is, this is his first five rounder. I'm not 100% sure on that. But Jan has a general size and power advantage. Don't sleep on that Polish power, man. Like it, 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 there, there is a reason he won that belt, and it's because he can throw hands with the best of them. I'd also say that left body kick for Jan Blakovic is something that could really disrupt the movement of Ankalaev, because actually, you know, it, when Ankalaev is moving into range, you could see that left body kick coming, and. Uh, and Jan will be free to throw that because I don't think he's got too much to worry about really in the wrestling department here. Because generally speaking, it's like it's not like you know you're seeing um, Magomedan Kalaev just constantly shooting takedowns and and trying to uh, to out wrestle people. He doesn't really. On average, he only shoots one takedown a fight. You know, he, he, and his takedown accuracy is only 33%. I don't think that Jan Blakovic has too much to worry about when it comes to the wrestling. So I think actually this is going to play out on the feet. And I think there are far more dangers here for Ankalaev than people are given credit. Because Jan Blakovic has got just such a lovely straight right hand. He throws straight punches really, really well. The reason that Ankalaev was able to just like dust uh, Ion Kutalaba in their rematch so easily was because Ion Kutalaba just swings wild round the side looking for that big haymaker. Jan Blakovic doesn't do that. His power comes down the middle and it's really, really powerful stuff as well. So for me, you couple that with the uh, with the left body kick that actually covers a lot of range. It negates um, Ankalaev wanting to stay in kickboxing range because Ankalaev is probably going to want to stay in kicking range. He's going to want to kick the legs. He's going to want to kick the body because we've seen him do that. You know, he he will he will kick people and strike with them and exhaust them until they are ready to kind of keel over, and then he'll hit them with something big. You saw him do that with. Um, uh, Jukum Bala, Jukum Bala, the 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 massive um, African dude, the middleweight. Anyway, like he he hit him with a front kick, but Jukum Bala, I can't remember what it's Jukum Bala, I think it is. Anyway, Jukum Bala just he was already exhausted. He's not built to go five rounds, but. For me, Jan Blakovic is Jan Blakovic isn't going to get that tired. I don't think, and. We saw him lose against Glover Teixeira because Glover just took him down and just got that uh, rear naked choke real, real quick. I don't think he's got that much to worry about with the wrestling, as I said. So, because Magomed Ankalaev, he's not like one of these like Dagestan like wrestling, you know, purists. He doesn't shoot a lot of takedowns. He has zero submissions on his record. I think this stays standing, and I think that Yan could lure Magomed Ankalaev into a firefight here. And if he lures him into a firefight, I think that's a firefight that Jan Blakovic can win. It's probably my heart rule in my head here. But I'm taking Jan Blakovic by knockout. That's what I'm going for. Terrible decision, I know. Look, I know, I know full well how good Magomed Ankalaev is. But I don't know. I, I'm not... I'm just rolling the dice on Polish power one more time. One more time. Polish power to get that knockout. He lifts that belt again. And he doesn't even have to fight Glover for it. He'll, he'll probably fight him. That'll be the next fight afterwards. But anyway, I'm really looking forward to these fights. I'll be putting up a post with my uh, bets. It's the underscore Bert underscore Green on Instagram. That's where I'll usually post it. I'll get the, you know, the actual accumulator up there. Let me know in the comments. Who are you betting on? I always love seeing people's bets people's bets coming off and going but mine usually go very very wrong but that's some of the fun that i find in it so uh yeah anyways i'll be wrapping these up next week so uh until then keep those odds long and those bets terrible